Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our session with Tarek Ali this afternoon. Tarek Ali is going to be talking us, to us today about what we can learn from terrorists, a dangerous topic if ever there was one. Tarek is a writer, essayist, filmmaker, born in Lahore, educated at Oxford University. He's a broadcaster, contributor to many uh, newspapers, to the London Review of Books, and is a long-standing editor of the New Left Review. His fiction includes a series of historical novels about Islam, a quintet that has concluded recently with The Night of the Golden Butterfly to great acclaim. I'm particularly delighted that he's here at the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. If you look back at Tarek's work, and he's an extremely prolific writer, you find titles of his non-fiction books, including The Coming British Revolution, Trotsky for Beginners, Who's Afraid of Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> Clash of Fundamentalisms, Crusades, Jihads and Modernity, Bush in Babylon, Conversations with Edward Said, of course, Pirates of the Caribbean, Axis of Hope, one of my favourite book titles of all time, and of course, The Protocols of the Elders of Sodom and other essays. So you can see that he really belongs here. His most recent book, The Obama Syndrome, Surrender at Home and War Abroad, has been met with great interest in the US. Tarek is an activist, a polemicist, and also someone who writes wonderful fiction, someone who has a taste for politics and geopolitics, but who is also a fighter for ideas and a wordsmith of great distinction. He's in Australia to present the 2010 Edward Said Memorial Lecture at the University of Adelaide on the future of Palestine, Israeli protectorate, genuine, genuine independence, or a single state solution. So there may be a few of us who might be tempted to go and get on a plane to enjoy that as well. But he's here to talk about a different topic this afternoon, so I will hand over to him. We'll have time for some questions and discussions from you at the end, so be ready. I'm sure that there will be many of things from his work that you'll want to talk to him about. Tariq Ali. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, good to be in Australia again, especially with a few Greens in Parliament. <clears throat> Always good when mainstream political parties receive a shock. Uh, now, the subject for the, this evening, what we can learn from the terrorists, seems very provocative, but actually, by the time I finished, I hope you'll see that it's quite commonsensical. Uh, though, of course, it challenges the dominant ideas of the day. And I will also talk a bit about history and the history of terrorism. Because contrary to what people imagine, terrorism was neither spawned by Islam or that religion, and nor will it end with it. This is something which has existed uh, for some time, and the word is often misused. It's applied to liberation movements, it's applied to people who have been struggling for freedom, uh, it's applied to uh, people who tried to chuck the Brits out of Africa, Cyprus, uh, India. They were called terrorists. And then when the British were forced to sit at the table with them and do deals with them, they suddenly were transformed into statesmen. So one shouldn't take appellations too seriously. Um, if you look back, I mean... If you look at the world today, I would say that we are living through a period of transition. And the interesting thing about periods of transition is that people normally living through them don't realize it's a transition. For them, it's everyday life. Uh, it's the problems they have to deal with. But I think it is a period of transition, and it's a period of transition which opened up in the late 90s after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, because with that collapse also collapsed ideologies interrelated but of a different kind. One, of course, was communism and that whole world, but the second, which has been less talked about, is collapsing, but which collapsed nonetheless <clears throat> was social democracy. And the collapse of social democracy helped to create a vacuum 
which is very similar to a vacuum which existed in the late 19th century. Now, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but if you <clears throat> look back, the defeats inflicted on the revolutions, which were democratic revolutions of 1848 and which erupted all over Europe with people demanding freedom, rights, electoral rights, uh, uh, an end to oligarchic uh, rule, an end to uh, the dictatorship of the rich, as they, they, they called it, followed by the big eruption of the Paris Commune in 1871, brutally crushed, uh, partially by uh, Bismarck, but largely by reactionary forces uh, within. And after that, you had a period of transition. And that period of transition was a situation where you had a concert of powers big powers, there was no one dominant power, but you had a concert of powers whose main goal was to try and keep the populations of Europe and North America, though that was distant, down. Keep the populations under control. And that attempt to keep populations under control through repression, through the lack of civil liberties, through not permitting political organizations, created an atmosphere where a whole bunch of anarchist groups arose. Anarchism was a, you know, the dominant philosophy of large sections of the European left. And they believed in what they called the propaganda of the deed, by which they meant bumping off emperors and presidents because they thought that would have a big impact, and in some cases they thought that if you killed the Tsar of Russia or the President of France, the society would come tumbling down. Of course it never did, but the actions in themselves, there is absolutely no doubt, were popular, and the result of these actions was large-scale repression. And this repression only increased the size of those protesting. And the, 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 the successes of the uh, anarchist uh, terrorists, and they didn't uh, decline that name, by the way, uh, the, the effect of uh, 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 this was to, to some extent, there's no doubt about it, was to raise consciousness. And if you look at 19th century Europe, you know, there were sort of strange things going on. There was a strike by the weavers of Lyon in France, and the strike was defeated. And there is a report of two weavers marching, walking all the way from Lyon to Paris and asking a bystander, where does the bourgeoisie live? <laughs> and when the bystander said, but what do you mean? And they said, well, where do they live? And he said, why do you want to know? And they said, we've come to blow them up. <clears throat> now, it's a sort of very simple uh, uh, request, but deep underneath it was an anger, a bitterness, and a hatred over the conditions in which they lived. And one guy, one anarchist, whose wife and children were dying, literally dying of starvation, thought he was going to die too because they had no food to eat, and he thought, I'll throw a bomb in the French Chamber of Deputies, the French Parliament, just to wake them up. And he did. A few mem members of Parliament were injured. No one died. The guy was caught, sentenced to death, and guillotined. And immediately, another anarchist came in his place and said, OK, for, and announced in public, for what he has done, I am going to assassinate President Carnot who refused to sign life imprisonment to spare his life, and he did it. And when he was being tried, he said, they said to him, but in your attempt to kill the president, you kill lots of innocent people. And he said, there are no innocents. Quite chilling. And then he said this, his name was Emile Henry, Henri, Henry. I was convinced that the existing organization of society was bad. I wanted to struggle against it so as to hasten its disappearance. I brought to the struggle a profound hatred. 
intensified every day by the revolting spectacle of a society where all is base, all is cowardly, where everything is a barrier to the development of human passions, to generous tendencies of the heart, to the free flight of thought. I wanted to show the bourgeoisie that their pleasures would be disturbed, that their golden calf would tremble violently on its pedestal until the final shock would cast it down in mud and blood. We do not spare bourgeois women and children because the wives and children of those we love are not spared either. Are not those children innocent victims who in the slums die slowly of anemia because bread is scarce at home? Or those women who grow pale in your workshops and wear themselves out to earn 40 sous a day and yet are lucky when poverty does not turn them into prostitutes? Those old people whom you have turned into machines for production all their lives and whom you cast on the garbage dump and into the workhouse when their strength is exhausted. At least have the courage of your crimes, gentlemen of the bourgeoisie, and agree that our reprisals are fully legitimate. You have hanged men in Chicago, cut off their heads in Germany, strangled them in Harris, shot them in Barcelona, guillotined them in Montbrison and Paris, but what you will never destroy is anarchism. Its roots are too deep. It is born in the heart of a corrupt society which is falling to pieces. He was hanged, he was executed. But what happened after this phase of violent attacks all over Europe and North America, <clears throat> especially the United States, what happened was that political parties, political movements emerged. Trade unions emerged. Organizations emerged which fought for the same aims and the same goals in a different way by mobilizing large numbers of ordinary people, by challenging bourgeois parties in elections, and by trying to create a better world. Now, to a certain extent they succeeded, and to some extent they did not. I want to compare this period I've just been talking about with what has happened to the world since the 90s. We have seen, we have, we have a concert of powers again, where the world basically kowtows before the United States, and that is different, because now we have a world hegemon, the only imperial power in the world, with more resources, military resources, than the next 10 countries put together. <clears throat> and this power feels that it can rule the world as it wishes and can do what it wants. And the powers of the European Union and the Far Eastern states, and obviously Australia, that goes without saying, fall into line, do what they are asked to do, <clears throat> despite the fact that in many cases, the citizens of these countries do not like what is being done in their name and are powerless to stop it. So you had a consensus economically where we were told that the only model of capitalism on offer was neoliberal capitalism, end of state intervention, end of helping, sustaining, strengthening a social welfare state, privatizations, if it moved, if it could make a profit, privatize it. Water, electricity, all the basic needs <coughs> of citizens were privatized. And you were not allowed to challenge this. And a new language emerged, the language of neoliberalism, where all this was described as reforms. And if you challenged it, you were accused of being hostile to reforms. You were not modern enough. And this has been going on till the crash of 2008, when suddenly this entire system, feeding in on itself, creating a world of debt and crazed consumerism, <clears throat> 